I'm Sharon Thompson, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences, and I also co-direct the Community Outreach and Dissemination Corps for the Hispanic Health Disparities Research Center with Dr. Bird, and I work with Holly as well. So I, this should probably be basic review for you, and I was thinking we probably should have done this at the beginning of the day, but it'll just be kind of a refresher. In education, we call this reinforcement. So there are three fundamental principles of research ethics, and that includes respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. And I think it's important, um, we, we all have probably studied these in, in school or when you're having to take an online um, uh, ethics training or whatnot, and these uh, principles should be universal, and it should be applied universally, but when we think about resources and people working in communities, sometimes the resources are limited and they may not have an advisory board or an ethics committee because of limited resources. But regardless of the limitations, these principles should always be applied universally. So respect for persons. Just each individual is unique and free. Each individual has the right and capacity to decide. Each individual has value and dignity and each individual has the right to informed consent, which we've gone through pretty extensively today. Vulnerable participants. List groups of people considered to be vulnerable research participants. And we kind of know classic examples, but maybe even think of some specific to our region that may be a little unique. Undocumented workers, absolutely. Military, Military very good, interesting. Any, any other vulnerable participants? Well, there's kind of the people we typically think of in research, minors, pregnant women, and uh, prisoners. And we talked about some of those groups this afternoon. Persons with mental disabilities, persons who are illiterate or have limited formal education, persons with lim limited access to health services, and certainly in our region, uh, that is a pervasive issue. And, a large segment of the population has limited access to medical services. Um, and then women in some set settings, but I think uh, undocumented uh, persons, military personnel, um, maybe victims of domestic violence or violent cartel violence. We have some unique situations on the border. And you gave me the research ethics documents, kind of like the you know, the Declaration of Helsinki and all the, all the things that we learn when we take an ethics class, we do the IRB review, but which we usually forget shortly thereafter. Um, so um, some of the, you know, the most, kind, everybody's seen these if you've taken one of those IRB courses. Nuremberg refers to post-World War II when um, people started recognizing some of the atrocities that were happening in research. Um, Helsinki, Belmont, and CIOMS. Some people might not be familiar with that one. We're going to talk about that one. But that's the Council for International Organizations of Medical Science. And, um, and they have really, in collaboration with the World Health Organization, kind of expanded upon some of these documents. And um, so my purpose here is to just kind of briefly go over these and say, you know, well, what are they, how, how do they impact us in our research? And, and to remind us that they're not, um, they're not just these documents that were there and done and over with, but they're sort of living, changing um, because of the World Health Organization and because of the Council of International Organizations of Medical Sciences. Um, they keep sort of revisiting the issue, and especially with community-based participatory research, that's a good thing for us because rather than just say, oh, well, we've, you know, we've been talking about respect, beneficence, and justice for 60 years, we don't really have to think about it anymore, um, it forces us, us to think about it. So um, the Declaration of Helsinki, um, the, the biggest point of that was that the well-being of the participants is number one consideration. It's more important than the research. It's more important than any benefit the funding agency is going to get. Um, it's more important than, um, you know, maybe the ultimate benefit to another group. But the participants in your research take precedence in terms of, um, in terms of where, the well, where your efforts are directed in protecting well-being. So consent should be in writing. These were, these were things that came out of the Declaration of Helsinki. Um, if there's a dependent relationship, like people in rehab, people in prison, um, people who are being in a therapy situation, um, you know that used to be needs to be extra carefully looked at and approved and evaluated, and, and a lot of times it um, it results in studies not being approved if there's that dependence or that coercion or um, power relationship. 
Um, in 2001, this was something, you know, the Declaration of Helsinki, we think, oh, that was long ago. But in 2001, they, it, they added to it um, to limit the use of placebo. And Dr. Bird touched on that, that, you know, for some illnesses now where there already are effective treatments, it doesn't make sense to, to revisit the placebo issue because you're placing people at unnecessary risk. It's better to compare the new drug with one that we already know is somewhat effective. Um, so that's a relatively new sort of addition to research ethics documents. And then the last one, participants benefiting from research, um, that's also become uh, an important issue, especially in international research. It's not considered okay anymore to just go do research and bail. You know, there's got to be some benefit to, um, and Dr. Bird used the example of the dental clinic that never happened earlier. Um, that's not okay. And it, it is expected now that if you're going to do research in communities, um, there should be a benefit, not just the $5 or the $20 or whatever the amount of compensation or incentive that the participant gets, but there should be a tangible benefit to the community.